And here's part two. Okay, so uh, solving out this trig identity. Uh, first thing, we're going to change that cosecant squared to 1 plus cotangent squared uh, so that it will match the 7 cotangent that we have in there already. That way we can have just one trig function in this identity that we're trying to solve. Now this will simplify to cotangent squared minus 7 cotangent minus 8 equals 0. Uh, and that will factor into two pieces, either cotangent theta plus one is equal to zero or cotangent theta minus eight is equal to zero. So on the one hand, we need cotangent to be equal to negative one which happens at two angles on the unit circle on the second and fourth quadrants. So three pi over four and seven pi over four. And on the other hand, we get cotangent, cotangent theta is equal to eight, which means that tangent theta is equal to one over eight and we'll need to get a reference angle. So that reference angle. Is going to be the inverse tangent of one eighth. Which if we take that to a calculator, making sure that we are in radian mode we get an answer that should come out in the unit circle or should come out in the first quadrant. Uh, keep in mind that a reference angle is always in the first quadrant. So if that one eighth weren't already positive, I would make it positive when I'm finding this reference angle. Uh, but when I plug that in, I got 0 0.1244. All right, and then coming back to what our problem was, we have the tangent theta is equal to positive one eighth. So tangent of theta is positive, which means I should find solutions in quadrant one and quadrant three, since those are the two quadrants where tangent is positive. So Q1 and Q3. So theta should just be the reference angle in quadrant one. And theta is pi plus the reference angle in quadrant two. So 0 0.1244 for that first quadrant. and 3.2659 in the third quadrant. So in the box, we put all four answers, three pi over four, seven pi over four, 0 0.1244, and 3.2659. And those are our four solutions. Problem 16, uh, instead of finding only solutions between zero and two pi, I wanna find all general solutions. Uh, so on the one hand, I have cosine of theta equals zero. Uh, and I get two solutions to that. I have that theta is equal to pi over two 
or theta is equal to three pi over two. And since we're looking for uh, the general solutions, I know that any coterminal angle to either of these unit circle angles uh, will also give a, an exact solution. So I add 2k pi to each of those. Meanwhile, on the other side, I had sine of 5 theta plus 1 equals 0. Actually, I'm going to move these around a little bit. So I know I'm going to end up needing more space for this one. So sine of 5 theta plus 1 is equal to 0, which means that sine of 5 theta is equal to negative 1. And this happens at just one spot. So only when 5 theta is equal to 3 pi over 2, do we get this setup? Uh, since I would have to be down at the at the lowest point in the unit circle. And this is where any angle that's coterminal to three pi over two would also solve the set. So I'll add two K pi in this phase. Uh, and then I can divide five over to both sides. So three pi over 10 plus two K pi over five. And then those three equations are all part of my solution. Problem 17, we're given information to solve reference triangles for both alpha and beta, and then asked to solve some equations based on alpha and beta. So step one, will be creating those reference triangles. So I have that secant is negative, but sine is positive. So x is negative, y is positive. That'll put us into the second quadrant. Whereas for beta, we are just told that beta is between pi and three pi over two, which means the third quadrant. So let's do alpha in blue. So alpha is in blue and beta is in red. Move that sort of out of the way. So secant, which is hypotenuse over adjacent. That should be 17 as the hypotenuse with a negative eight as the adjacent side. Uh, which means through the Pythagorean theorem, we'll get that 15 is the opposite side. And for beta, we know that tangent of beta is root 15, which is the same as root 15 over one. So root 15 should be the opposite side while one is the adjacent side. And because we're in the third quadrant, these should both be negative. Uh, and then we'll use the Pythagorean theorem to get that the hypotenuse is four. All right, now we have our reference triangles. So we'll go solve uh, the other two parts. So in part A, I want the sine of alpha plus beta, which is sine alpha plus, oops, let's try that one more time. Sine alpha cosine beta, there we go plus sine beta cosine alpha. And we'll change a couple of the colors, alpha in blue, beta in red. So we'll have four different values to plug in. Starting with alpha, we know that sine of alpha is 15 over 17 while cosine of alpha is negative eight over 17. 
And for beta, cosine of beta is negative one fourth, while sine of beta is negative root 15 over four. And the last step will just be to simplify that as much as we can. So it looks like negative 15 plus eight square root 15 divided by four times 17, which is 68. And that's our solution. Then on to the cosine of beta over two, which from the formula we know should be plus or minus the square root of one plus cosine beta. Emphasize that that's in red, divided by two. So when we're deciding on that plus or minus, we need to know which quadrant beta over two is in. We were actually given an inequality for beta, so we can bring that down. So as we look back up at that beginning information at the top of the screen, beta is in between pi and three pi over two. So since I am interested in which quadrant beta over two is in, I'm gonna multiply that entire inequality by one half, which gives me that beta over two is in between pi over two and three pi over four, which is in the second quadrant. And so because beta over two is in the second quadrant, I know that the cosine of beta over two is negative. So even though cosine of beta is in the third quadrant or beta is in the third quadrant, uh, cosine of beta over, blah, blah, blah. beta is in the third quadrant while beta over two is in the second quadrant. And it just so happens that both of those come out to negative for cosine, uh, but I am choosing the negative because of the work done in magenta being in, in quadrant two. Cool, with all that out of the way, let's actually simplify this square root. So this is negative square root of one plus negative one over four all divided by two. I'll multiply four to top and bottom, giving me negative square root, negative square root of four minus one all over eight. an extra long square root that I didn't really need. Let's shorten that a bit. Uh, so negative square root of three eighths. Uh, or if we wanted to rationalize this thing, uh, this would be negative root six divided by four. Right, on to 18, we have a ship that travels 58 miles due east and adjust its course to be 72 degrees east of north. Uh, after traveling 89 miles in this direction, how far is the ship from its point of departure? I include a labeled illustration. So if we go about making this illustration. So we know that a ship is going to start by traveling due east. So about that direction, since that would be, you know, in a due east, in a due east manner. Uh, then turns to be 72 degrees east of north, uh, the complement of which is 18 degrees. Uh, since my ruler is measuring from the horizontal line, 
18 degrees, and I need that to be 72 degrees from a vertical line. And so we end up with that mess right there. Then we need to somehow connect these pieces. Hey, now. Really easier to come from the top. And I'm going to just erase a little bit that I don't need. Okay. So here is our, here's our diagram. It ends up being a pretty shallow triangle. So I'm just going to do what I can to make my diagram a little bit bigger. Okay, now it's just laughing at me. All right, one more time. There we go. Now we've got a slightly bigger, slightly bigger diagram, which will help us out for actually labeling the thing. Since I know if I come over and draw this vertical line right here, uh, what, is, what are the things that we know? I know that this angle is 72 degrees, uh, since that's the bearing I was given. Uh, I also know that there is a right angle on the other side of that vertical line. And we know a couple of distances. This distance is going to be 50, 58 miles. And we have this distance that is 89 miles. That's everything that we have. So in the end, we want to know how far this ship is from its point of departure. So looks like this is going to be a law of cosines problem where if I label the missing side to be C, which is what we're going to solve for, it means that I have angle C right here and angle C should be 90 degrees plus 72 degrees. And that comes out to 168 degrees. That's, that's the actual angle that's on the interior of the triangle that's drawn. So to find that missing side, I want to set up a law of cosines problem. So C squared should be equal to 58 squared plus 89 squared minus two times 58 times 89 times the cosine of 168 degrees. Wow, my math was really off on that, wasn't it? Uh, that is definitely 162 degrees, uh, since there's an 18 degree difference between that and 180. Uh, it must have been where I pulled that eight from, but clearly that was incorrect. So yeah, 162 degrees is angle C. Also, that's supposed to be an eight. It's not very clear. There we go. Okay, so that means that C is going to be the square root of whatever we get on the other side. Let me just compute that real quick. Plus 89 times 89. Minus two times 58 times 89 times the cosine of 
162 degrees. So before taking the square root, I got 21,103.7. Call it 7,1. Uh, either way, this is all getting plugged into a calculator to then get its square root. I got 145.3. And that's in miles, I do believe. Yeah, we were in miles. And I also noticed that the problem said do two decimal places of accuracy, so 0.27 miles. All right. And finally, one more word problem. Woman entering an outside glass elevator on the ground floor of a hotel glances up to the top of the building across the street and notices an angle of elevation of 48 degrees. She rides the elevator up three floors, which is 60 feet, finds the angle of elevation then to only be 32 degrees. How far is the building across the street? So we'll once again draw ourselves a picture. So woman is riding up an elevator from over here. And we'll also have a ground floor going on, or just a ground. And we're going to measure a couple of angles of elevation, the first of which is a 48 degree angle of elevation. Which I'll mark in right here. Uh, then she's going to go up. 60 feet and measure a 32 degree angle of elevation. So let's say that that's 60 feet right over here. All right, and then where those two points intersect must be the top of our building. over here yeah so on to the other side i'll just come and measure that part where we actually rode the elevator up and darken it in so everything that we know uh this darkened in distance should be 60 feet pull my ruler up one last time I need to measure a horizontal line from the top of the elevator about right here. Okay, and now we should have enough of our diagram drawn know that this angle of elevation, which we measured first, was 48 degrees. The second angle of elevation, which would be this one, is 32 degrees. And ultimately, we'd like to find the height of the building across the street. Now, in order to do that, I'm going to need to know the length of this hypotenuse, C, since the, uh, the rectangle that, or the triangle I'm going to be looking at is this one drawn in right here. So that's a right triangle with an angle of 48 degrees, an opposite side of H, and a hypotenuse of C. So I can get the equation that the sine of 48 degrees is equal to the opposite side, which I labeled H, divided by the hypotenuse, which I labeled C. 
so I don't know, I want to find H and I don't yet know C, which means I'm going to need to solve the other triangle first. Uh, that oblique triangle is the name we've been giving to it. It's over on the other side. So I'm going to need to fill in some missing pieces. Uh, namely, I'm going to want the angle that's on the interior of the triangle, uh, which would be this one right here. It's the complement of 48 degrees, so 42 degrees. Uh, I've also labeled side C, which means I also know what angle C is going to need to be. Uh, and in fact, angle C should be 90 plus that 32. which works out to 122 degrees. Putting all that together, I'm missing now one angle, which I suppose can be B. I guess that means that my first point is A, uh, but I'd like to find angle B, but I should have enough information for that now. It should be 180 minus 42 minus 122. Uh, and what does that come out to? Is it 16? I think it's 16. Okay, now we should have enough to get A using, or C using the law of sines. We should have that C divided by the sine of 122 is equal to 60 divided by the sine of 16 degrees. Meaning that C is equal to 60 times the sine of 122 divided by the sine of 16. And then ultimately I'm going to use that as a substitution into that original sine angle or that original uh, sine equation that I started with. So, Let's grab that from up here. Hey, now. Drag it down a little bit. Because then we'll have that H, the height that we're ultimately trying to solve for, is equal to C times the sine of 48 degrees. which is 60 times the sine of one angle divided by the sine of another angle times the sine of yet a third angle. This is 122 degrees. Uh, that denominator angle is 16 degrees. And finally, this angle is 48 degrees. And we'll plug all that into a calculator to get our solution, which is uh, 16 degrees is in the denominator. The numerator, I had 122 degrees, and on the other angle, I had 48 degrees. Plugging all of that in and checking, we need two decimal places of accuracy. So 137 points, one nine feet.
And that's the end of the practice exam. That last page is just the formula sheet.